do and also how I, um, and also how I became involved with the OLF. So um, the OLF, I initially found out through people I already knew, um, like Tim um, and Becky, um, and I completed their Becoming a Conservation Leader course back in February. Um, which I found was incredibly helpful in developing um, my current leadership skills um, and the course offered a really exciting new perspective on, um, on what a successful leader should be like and of course um, working in conservation you know in my role I'm working with a lot of people so um, including volunteers and it was important to to me to be able to show that they um, are valued and you know well respected as they should be. Um, a bit about myself, um, I started volunteering um, 10 years ago now with the at Rolling Water Nature Reserve. Um, it, I started off by um, doing some work experience with the Rutland Osprey project. I was involved with a fantastic group um, called Wild Skills, which um, was for um, people between the age of 14 and 18 so it was a really good way to start developing some more practical side of conservation so we, you know they helped build bird boxes clear meadows etc and that was really really great um i've always had i've been very lucky to know that conservation was the area i kind of wanted to go down and the career i wanted to follow so i went on to study ecology at Aberystwyth University, which was fantastic. Highly re recommend that university. Um, and then after that, I was lucky to spend a year as a trainee reserve officer um, for the Leicestershire and Wildlife Trust, um, where I was based at Rutland Water Nature Reserve. Um, and that was a brilliant year, developing skills uh, through chainsaws to pesticides to bird ID skills, and also it gave us the opportunity to run guided events. Um, and um, um, yeah, it was brilliant. So I currently work for the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, which is one of 46 individual wildlife trusts across the country. Um, we manage 35 nature reserves across Leicestershire and Rutland. And our aim is to connect, A, to connect people, um, as many people as possible with nature and the local environment, um, but also to um, protect um, the current habitat um, on our nature reserves um, and to um, increase the area that we can, um, you know, increase our land and therefore um, our outreach. Um, so Rutland Water Nature Reserve is a really, it's an, a fantastic place to work. Um, it's a site of special scientific interest and it's also a designated Ramsar site um, and it's an internationally important wetland. Um, it covers an area of around 1,000 acres um, and it's home during the winter months to about over 25,000 um, wildfowl. Um, during the autumn and winter, like Widgeon, Gadwall. Um, so it's a lot of activity during the autumn and winter. Um, but the reserve is also home to the Rutland Osprey project, um, which is the area of work I'm involved with. Um, the Osprey project began in the mid 1990s to, with the aim to uh, reintroduce the population of breeding ospreys to central England after they had become extinct as a breeding bird. Um, and this was done through a really pioneering project, the translocation project, which saw osprey chicks being um, removed from under license um, from uh, nests up in Scotland where they were um, moved down to Rutland Morton Nature Reserve where they were released. Um, and in 2001, that was the first real major milestone because that was the first year an osprey um, pair successfully raised a chick um, at Rutland um, so that was really exciting and since then the population of ospreys has increased and today we have around up to 10 breeding pairs um, which is really exciting so 26 years on um, we can say that the um, osprey project has been a success 
um, and our future aims really will be to increase public engagement um, and also help encourage ospreys to breed slightly further afield. Uh, so what do I do? Um, well, I'm based, currently based at the Trust Only Visitor Centre at Linden. Um, it's the best place to see the ospreys. Um, and my main role is um, current is engaging with as many visitors as possible, talking ospreys to as many people as possible, which is fantastic. Um, I help run the Linden Visitor Centre alongside two, um, two colleagues. Um, and I also manage a fantastic team of volunteers, which um, without whom the project wouldn't have been as successful as it has been. Um, and we certainly wouldn't get, um, well, my job certainly wouldn't be as exciting and fun um, if it weren't for them. Um, they're a brilliant team and um, yeah, they're really enjoyable to work with. Um, I run a lot of guided events. We run regular Osprey cruises on Rutland water um, and it's a really diverse role when you come to think of it. Um, there's no such thing as a typical day. Um, no two days are the same, which I think I really enjoy the flexibility. I really enjoy the variety of um, different things you can get up to during a day. Um, you can have nothing planned other than, you know, manning the visitor center, talking to visitors, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the BBC are, ar BBC are arriving to record a feature for that night's program. So it's really varied and um, it, I think within my role, it's important to be able to be flexible. Um, obviously, there are, of course, highlights um, within the role and I've been really, really lucky to be involved with um, some media. So we've had the BBC in, um, I do regular radio interviews with the local radio station. Um, and that's been all been really exciting. And if you'd asked me when I first got the job, um, if I thought I'd be, you know, on TV, I would say no. <laughs> um, and it wouldn't have been something I'd have been comfortable doing either. But over the past couple of years, you know, working with people, confidence builds, um, etc. And it's, it's turned out to be brilliant. Um, days spent outside of the visitor centre have always been really, really good. Um, and that helping Tim with some um, monitoring of the off-site nests. And that's been, I've been really lucky to be involved with um, some of that work. Um, obviously, the ospreys are a migratory species, so um, they're not found, not here in the autumn and winter months. And I've been, well, the volunteers have kept me very busy with um, leading their work parties that they do during the winter months at the reserve. And that's been brilliant to, you know, be more outside, um, use the skills I've developed as a trainee, um, but also ensure that the osprey volunteer team are remain connected through the off season. And of course, it's the people that you meet along the way that really make the job worthwhile. And um, it's, yeah, it's really been a really good role so far. Um, so I've, I always thought when I started out, I'd be working in a more practical role, um, maybe as a reserve officer, um, however, I found that I really enjoy um, working with people. Um, so um, my future direction is more public facing and I am due to start a new role with Dorset Wildlife Trust in a couple of months time, in a month or so's time, um, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, and yeah, that's it <laughs> from me. So thanks, thanks again for listening. Abby, you caught me off guard because you're so you're so punctual. You were bang on bang on time, which is very impressive. Um, anyway, um, now 
before we move on to the next talk, uh, which Bethan's going to give, I just wonder um, if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask Gabby, if you could either put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, Abby. Um, what's kind of, what's, I mean, obviously you've just um, explained about your new job and congratulations on that. It's very well deserved. I know that. Um, what's your highlight of your time at working at Rutland Water? Could you pick any one thing out? Um, when I was ringing, helping you ring the ticks, um, just having the privilege of being back close to an osprey chick, um, yeah, it's just exciting. Yeah, but it's always good. It's yeah. hard to beat that. <laughs> well, I'm probably a bit biased, but I agree with you. Um, it's fantastic. Um, now we've got a got a question. So, um, I must say, Abby. I've known you for a long time. I'm not going to embarrass you, but you know, you. I think you've just become such an excellent public speaker. Um, and someone's actually asked, um, "Do you have any tips on improving confidence with public speaking?" Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think have a smile. Um, I find just pretend you're talking to a room full of people you know. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, no one's going to really judge you if you you know make a mistake um we all we all slip up um but it's just i think just do as much as you can of it as well because the more you do the less um daunting the less challenging it is um and yeah if you told me like two years ago i'd be doing something like this you wouldn't have got me doing this <laughs> <laughs> Well, good for you, and you're very good at it. Um, and Abby, um, Steve Davis from the Dorset Wildlife Trust is actually um, on the um, in the audience tonight, and he's saying, not a question, but a comment on behalf of Dorset Wildlife Trust. We are absolutely delighted that Abby is joining us soon. So, um, yeah, that's very nice. And um, you're, you've got a you've got a good one there, Steve. So I'm I'm sure that Abby's going to do a great job for you, and uh, yeah, you'll all really enjoy working together. Anyway. Um, if we've got no further questions, Abby, I just wanted to say thank you very much um, for sharing your um, story about working at Rutland Water, which um, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, so thank you. And you can now sit back and relax and just enjoy the rest of the talk. So benefit of going first. Um, so we're going to move across um, to Bethan. So Bethan, do you want to? There we are, by the wonders of modern technology. Um, here we are. So, um, Beth, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself, but um, thank you very much. And there's a special thank you to Beth and tonight because she is the brains behind tonight. She's the person who has um, done all the organising behind the scenes. So a huge thank you, Beth, and for, for all you've done. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone who's, um, who's joined tonight. Anyway, so without further ado, I shall hand you over to Beth. Thank you, Tim. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, just before I start, my internet's being a bit weird here, and I did unfortunately just miss most of uh, Abby's talk. So if I suddenly cut out, maybe just skip to the next speaker, because it's taking me a while to get back online, but hopefully we'll get through it. Um, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm Bethan, as Tim said. I'm a PhD student currently based in the Czech Republic at the Institute of Vertebrate Biology, um, which is a Czech Academy of Sciences, and I'm based within the Primate Symbion Ecology Research Group. Um, and I'm gonna to talk today about primate conservation and the hidden world of parasites. Um, I'm kind of gonna split this talk into two sections. One, my kind of personal background, how I got involved in kind of primate parasitology, and then secondly, parasite conservation, uh, not parasite conservation, primate conservation, uh, primate parasites and the kind of link there and my actual research focus. So starting off with my conservation involvement and how I ended up involved with OLF was I first got involved with conservation working a placement for Earth Sea Sky on sea turtle conservation on Zakynthos in the Greek islands. Um, and then from there, I went on to do an internship at Heart Wildlife Rescue, which is focused on rehabilitation and release of British wildlife. 
I was then a volunteer with RSPB or the Royal Society for Protection of Birds um, working on heathland restoration and that was all alongside doing my bachelor's in zoology. Um, this inspired me to then do my master's in wildlife conservation and UAV technology or unmanned aerial vehicles such as drones. Um, and then I progressed on to do my PhD, which I'm currently doing. And then a couple of years ago, COVID hit and I was in lockdown and I needed to find something to spend my time with. And I was searching different online courses and OLF's Becoming a Conservation Leader course came up. Um, and that had all moved online because of COVID. So I opted to enroll on that. And that's kind of where my journey with OLF started. Um, in terms of my career path and becoming a primate parasitologist, I initially got interested in parasitology, which was actually through this book, which is all about parasites, manipulation of their hosts. So parasites are organisms that live typically on or inside a host species. Um, and yeah, this is a book all about how certain parasites manipulate the behavior of their hosts. Um, and that's where my interest in parasites and the kind of weird topic as some people see it uh, developed. I then did my master's, as I said, in wildlife conservation and was lucky enough to do my thesis, my dissertation on primate parasites looking at baboons in Tanzania. Um, that was for the field work and sample collection. And then for the laboratory part of that, I actually came to the Czech Republic for the first time and was based within the team here that I'm now based with permanently. After finishing my master's, I went back out to Tanzania to project manage the Greater Mahale Ecosystem Research and Conservation Project Field Site, which is primarily focused on primates. And that's how I then got really interested in primates. And that's primarily focused on chimpanzees. Um, and then after finishing my term out there, I then came back to the Czech Republic and enrolled as a parasitology PhD student focused on the parasites of mountain gorillas, um, really kind of combining my new loves of primates and parasitology together. Um, so my current role specifically, my PhD topic is on the epidemiology of helminth infections in great apes with emphasis on the mountain gorillas. Um, and epidemiology is just the study of disease and how disease change in those transmission and infections. And helminths are worm-like parasites typically found in the gastrointestinal tracts. Um, I'm specifically focused on strongly nematodes, which is also a research grant I'm carrying out right now on Asian great apes, so orangutans. Um, and these strongly nematodes, their eggs are what I typically study, which are shed in the feces from wild animals. And they're what you can see the different egg types along the top here. Um, to kind of summarize what my current work focuses on, I get fecal samples from various sites across Africa, in these fecal samples are contained all these different parasites and parasite eggs. I then take the genetic data from these parasites. I isolate that genetic data and sequence it to then look at the genetic diversity of those parasites that are living within the wildlife hosts. So what does a typical day look like for me? It can vary quite a lot. Um, obviously there's the field work involved with collecting the samples, which is my favorite bit, even though it can be frustrating at times. And then there's the laboratory work, whether that's in makeshift field labs or in state of the art sequencing labs. Um, and then actually a lot of my day to day is just on a laptop coding and doing bioinformatics and statistic analysis. So it's not all as exciting as these pictures make it look. Um, and I just wanted to highlight as I, or you saw from the picture earlier, I use fecal samples, which are poop samples. Um, and as much as this seems sometimes a bit of a weird thing to dedicate my life to studying, there's actually a lot of clues we can take from these samples. And especially for endangered species, they're a really nice way of surveying because they're non-invasive, they're relatively easy to collect. And we can get all sorts of data from that, whether that's on the host genetics to analyze and sample and count their population numbers, looking at their stress levels through different glucocorticoids. We can look at their microbiome, which is all the um, bacterial sections within their gastrointestinal tract. We can look at their nutrition with nutritional analysis to look at what these animals are eating, what they're digesting, what they're excreting, and then look at their parasites as well, which is obviously what I'm focused on. 
And then within parasitology, we have different um, methods that we use for analyzing these fecal samples, including microscopy, larvoscopy, and coprocultures, where we develop different stages of these larvae to study them. And then also fecal washing, where we try to attain adult worms. So shifting more to the actual research side of things, and specifically the kind of primate and parasitology link, um, the primate conservation status isn't a great one at all. You can see here from this map that kind of everywhere that primates are found, they're decreasing in populations. Um, and these colored bar charts at the graph, if you look at the global one, you can see that 75% of primate species are declining populations and over 55% of them are threatened species. So kind of, they are classified as one of the most endangered mammalian taxa. So they're really having a hard time out there in the world. Um, and one of the main links is taken from this quote at the bottom is that extensive habitat loss and deforestation that's occurring across those kind of um, tropical regions. But what's that got to do with parasitology? Well, as we continue to disturb habitat and degrade it, it basically fragments it, as seen in this example picture at the bottom of the, my slide here. And with that, we change the epidemiology, the disease transmission, the disease risks, and we shift how the natural kind of function of these parasites in the wildlife. So these parasites are typically asymptomatic in wild animals, but the more we change the parasite epidemiology, the more we're starting to see clinical symptoms of parasite infections in wildlife hosts as we kind of disrupt that natural balance. And this is through things directly, such as increased exposure and transmission, as there's less space and less forest for primates to inhabit, they're overlapping more with each other, so they're spreading more diseases. And then also reduced habitat quality in direct things such as poorer nutrition and chronic stress can also influence the parasites that these primates are harboring. It's also important, especially in recent times, to consider that zoonotic potential. As we also are primates, there's a lot of disease transmission that can occur between humans and primates. So as humans continue to press more into primate habitat, we risk that disease risk, which can go both ways. So the case of the mountain gorilla and my kind of real topic of study, the mountain gorilla has been a conservation success in um, recent years. In 2018, it was reclassified from critically endangered to endangered, um, which is really amazing, particularly for a primate species. Um, however, with this population increase has become increasing gorilla densities and increasing home range overlap. And this is because the areas and the parks that they're in are so set that there's no real area for spatial expansion. As you can see in the quick satellite image I've grabbed from Google, you can clearly see where the park boundary meets the um, anthropogenic land and the farming fields there. So with this increasing gorilla densities, those <laughs> excuse me, those shifting parasite epidemiologies are increasing the risks of change and transmission of parasites for those reasons that I discussed just before. Um, and then linked to that, we've recent in recent years seen gorilla fatalities, so gorilla deaths that when they've then been dissected, they've shown associated histopathological changes such as mild colitis and severe chronic chronic gastritis. So these are effectively um, symptoms of disease or upset within the gastrointestinal system, so the stomach and the intestines and the gut, which can be linked to parasitic infection. So our aim with our research is to kind of investigate these changes in parasite infections to see if there is anything going on there to help provide insight for gorilla conservation management. So one of the ways in which I'm helping to do this is to look at establishing baseline data for what parasites actually are infecting gorilla, particularly in terms of these strong-lived nematodes. Um, so one way in which we've done this is sampled both lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas in various different populations um, and look at the genetic diversity there. And from this one figure, you can see how strikingly different the diversity is between lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas. Um, so each vertical line here represents one gorilla, and then the different colors are different uh, parasite taxa within that gorilla. 
So you can see that Nakata and Esophagastum are really dominating the lowland gorillas. But then when we look at mountain gorillas, they're dominated by hyostrongulus in the blue. And then depending what populations they're found in, they're either co-dominated by Paralibostrongulus in red or Machidia in green, which shows that there are some real differences going on here, um, despite these really closely related host species. The wider implication of our research ties back to that zoonosis and that risk to humans. Um, with our research, we've identified shared parasites between the gorillas, both with humans and with livestock, which really highlights that close risk there is with human pathogens going into primate populations and also wild uh, primates posing a disease risk to humans, depending how much we continue to push that boundary. Um, I'd like to kind of tie it all together with everyday actions, because I know this can feel a bit kind of there's not much we can do about it, it's all away in the distance, but a lot of this deforestation is driven by our consumption and our demand for different products. So it's a, a nice reminder to kind of reduce consumption as much as we can and always use sustainably sourced products that we can. And then also if we're ever lucky enough to go and be involved in primate tourism, such as visiting the gorillas and gorilla trekking, to really practice that responsible primate tourism. And there's lots of resources there now to try and increase that responsible tourism practices. There's a lot of people I need to thank that help with my research and support and fund me. So my funders at the top for the Czech Academy of Sciences and the European Union Operational Programme Research Funds. And then all my collaborators from field assistants in the field to lab help to biostatisticians from all these different organizations here. And hopefully I've sticked to time and I want to thank you for listening and finish up with a quote from a fellow primatologist, just to give a kind of positive reinforcement in the conservation world of every individual matters, every individual has a role to play and every individual makes a difference. Um, my socials are there at the bottom in case you want to follow the work we do. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. That was brilliant, Beth, and thank you very much. I mean, I, I for one have learned a huge amount in the last 15 minutes. So thank you very much. And you're another brilliant speaker. Um, that was that was really, really great. Now, um, there's a few questions um, that have come in, so I'm going to um, fire away. Um, the first one is is from Barry, who's asking. Um, oh, I shouldn't turn my sound off. That wouldn't work. Um, Bethany, you've been lucky enough to travel extensively with your studying and work. Where's the most fascinating place you've been and why? I think at the moment I would have to say it is that Tanzania and that field site, the Greater Mahala Ecosystem and Research, because it is so there I was lucky enough to work with a habituated group of chimpanzees. And when you work with a habituated community of chimpanzees, you see how alike to humans they are, particularly with the youngsters. And you see the juveniles playing and you learn all their personalities. And to have that experience with such unique and incredible animals that are also so threatened is just an absolute privilege. So that would be my top pick for now. Great. Um... Now, um, Kat's uh, question next, um, which is completely different. Um, how did you find your transition from MSc to PhD? And did you get the first one you applied for? I, so to answer the first one about the transition, uh, I actually found it quite an easy transition. I think because I'd taken time out to work in the middle. So when I came to do my PhD, I'd come from a role of project managing a field site. So it was a lot easier for me to come into a PhD and be able to manage everything I then had to manage project wise. Cause it was like, I just then had my own individual project as such in a PhD um, because I'd had that step of managing a, a whole project. It was then easier to manage my PhD project. Um, and based on the application one, I was actually lucky and didn't really apply for this. It came up because I knew the team and then they had a student drop out. Um, 
so they more reached out to me, which I was super lucky and grateful for. Um, but PhDs are really competitive. So I know a lot of people that do keep trying and keep pushing. So I think if people are getting kind of, they're not getting their first PhD, I definitely keep trying and keep your options open because it is, yeah, they're one of those highly competitive things that is difficult to get a place on often. Some very sound advice there, I think. Um, now, David has got a question about primates again. So he says, I've spent a considerable amount of time observing baboons in South Africa, both within the bush environment in areas surrounding the Kruger National Park, as well as more um, baboons in the Western Cape. Is there any evidence to suggest that parasites found in an urban based population versus those living in bush stroke reserve in environments? So is there any difference between urban environments and... Um, yes, um, so this is actually very similar to what I did my master's thesis on. I looked at baboons in uh, around the research site in the undisturbed habitat and in the local village or town around the anthropogenic uh, fields. And really the research is very kind of mixed, both in my studies and in other studies. Um, in some places, it alters it for depending on the parasite taxa. Some they have more of given parasite taxa in the disturbed and less, and vice versa with other parasite taxa. Um, and it also is very heavily dependent on the primate species. For instance, baboons are a really good generalist. So they're quite easy to adapt to disturbance and they crop raid a lot. So actually, in some places for some parasite taxa, they actually had less parasites in the disturbed area because they were able to crop braid and had this amazingly nutritional food, um, which kind of counteracted and we think counterbalanced the effect of the habitat disturbance. But for more threatened species, baboons are a species of least concern. For other species that are more threatened that can't adapt so well to the anthropogenic environments, there's a lot more evidence that the parasites become more of an issue in the, through, uh, like the human disturbed environments. Brilliant. Well, I'd say it's a very comprehensive answer. Um, you're obviously the person to ask for that. Um, now, just one final question, which is actually for me. Um, you mentioned um, in your talk about responsible primate tourism being, you know, quite an important thing that people could potentially do. So have you got any recommendations for where is the best place to do that or, you know? Well, I think it really depends. And I think it depends primarily what your budget is and what animals you want to see. Um, but I think the things to do is one, just check reviews before you go. But then also make sure that you're just aware yourself. Um, for instance, the gorilla trekking I've heard is an incredible experience because to spend time with gorillas is, I'm sure, amazing because they're such a kind of charismatic species. Um, but they come with a price tag as well. Um, so I think, yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to answer that one. That I know in South America now, they're really trying to push uh, primate tourism and sustainable primate tourism as a big thing. And they're actually trying to make it into the equivalent of kind of bird watching, but with primates, um, because there's such a diversity in the different kind of neotropical regions there. So maybe South America is a good one to go for primate tourism. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was a really, really fascinating talk and also the questions as well. So thank you, Bethan. And thank you again for organising tonight. Um, we're really grateful for it. Um, OK, so um, having been in the Czech Republic, we're now going to Dorset and we're going to Seb. So hopefully Seb is there and ready to go. Hello. Hello. Hi, Seb. Um, so Seb, um, well, I'm not going to talk too much, but you're going to give us a, a talk on a completely different subject now on um, rewilding in Dorset, which I'm also really looking forward to. So without further ado, I shall um, hand you over. Lovely. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll just get my screen up. There we go. Hopefully that's all working for you. Um, yeah, hello. So good evening. Thank, my name's Seb. Uh, thank you all for coming along. 
and listening to these talks and hopefully learning a little bit about what, what we all do uh, as mentees of OLF. So this evening, I'm going to be speaking to you about the rewilding at Dorset Wildlife Trust site called Wild Woodbury that I've recently got a job at. So before that, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction about myself. So I'm joining you from the south coast of Dorset at the moment, and I guess I followed quite a classic route into conservation. Um, I studied conservation biology at university. I went on to do a traineeship at the Leicestershire Wildlife Trust before moving around, building up experience, working habitats team at the council, national trust, uh, before landing this job with the Dorset Wildlife Trust uh, at Wild Woodbury back in last November. And on this site, I'm in charge of all the ecological monitoring, uh, all the community engagement, the volunteering, and as there's just two of us working on the site, anything else that comes my way really. And it, it's great at keeping the role varied, similarly to, uh, to, to our previous two speakers, no, no day is really the same. I've just got up on, up on the screen some things that I like doing, so I'm very much into my butterflies and moths and currently a trainee bird ringer as well. So Wild Woodbury. So the Dorset Wildlife Trust bought this land in the summer of last year, so 2021. It's approximately 170 hectares or 420 acres in size and previously had pretty intensive farming on the, on the land. They kept about 40 cattle in just one of the fields and used the entire rest of the site to grow crops just to feed the cattle. So all that was being produced off the whole site was this 40 cattle of, which, went, which went for meat. Similar to, to many farms, they had high inputs of chemicals, very compacted ground in places, and also a high loss of topsoil in other places. And when the DWT purchased this land, their view was to rewild it. So why rewilding? Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we're currently in both an environmental and an ecological crisis. You know, Britain's one of the most nature depleted countries in the world as our use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and other synthetics have increased, so has the sterility of the land. We're seeing huge decreases in biodiversity, the mass extinction of species, and the collapse of whole ecosystems. It's something that we really need to change and change very, very, very fast. In, in addition to this, we're also, oh, let's just go back one. And in addition to this, we're also a nation that's incredibly disconnected from nature. Now, I, I can't really remember when it became a thing where people have to be told to go outside because it's good for us. And there's a couple of interesting concepts around this. Um, I'm sure you've heard of at least one of these, the, the first of which is shifting baseline syndrome, where each, where each generation has a new norm of what they expect the levels of species to be. So we don't view the situation we're in as bad as it actually is due to a lack of knowledge of its past condition. And this is very dangerous because it can often lead to a slow response to, to doing things in, in conservation. And when this is coupled with, with the other concept called the extinction of experience, by where in generally speaking, people are learning less and less about the natural world. They're passing less and less down to their children, nieces, nephews, friends, and this is leading to a diminishing spiral of intelligence about the natural world. And this lack of knowledge and passion can easily lead to ignorance, alienation, and apathy towards a topic. And in this case, ultimately the further extinction of species. So what are we doing about this at Wild Woodbury? So on this talk, I'm gonna focus on three main areas. The first of which being is the community and how we're planning to engage them with the site. So as you can see in the picture on the left, uh, this field highlighted in blue is about 40 acres and we're gonna open this completely up for the public, full access. They'll be able to come and play games, have a picnic, walk their dog. It'll be a green space for them to be able to come and, to come and enjoy. And in this country, most public rights of way and footpaths, you're squished up between a hedge and a barbed wire fence. So we're really looking to welcome people back onto a large chunk of this land particularly as they've been excluded from it for hundreds and hundreds of years. This site's only been owned by three different families since 1066, 
during the majority of which people have been excluded from the land. So to be able to give the people back 40 acres and say, here you go, it's going to really help to get people back outside. We're going to let this area naturally regenerate, eventually becoming a woodland in around 100 years time as it is very compacted. With paths through the woodland, we'll cut glades for you know, picnic tables, stargazing seats, wildflower areas. And this is going to also be combined with things such as a food forest. So we want to have a focus on community food growing. We've already got the trees can be seen in the top right, which uh, is 300 um, traditional apple trees. And along with other ones that we're going to buy, going to be a community food forest where you've got your trees, your fruit shrubs, your trailing fruit and veg, where people can come and they can come and manage it, they can come and harvest it for themselves. And then hopefully, again, get that interaction. We're also going to build some accessible raised beds where people can come and also grow fruit and veg, herb gardens. And all this is going to link in, hopefully, very well uh, with the buildings on site. So we have a number of agricultural buildings that are full of asbestos, old machinery, and they're going to have to come down. But this leaves us with a really quite sizable footprint to build new structures on. We've consulted with the community, uh, with both the local community and the wider Dorset community, about what they'd like to see on site, what's going to benefit them. And it's still very much in discussion. But a few kind of ideas along the lines of a farm shop, cafe, maybe pop up art studios, a green service station, or even a GP surgery. And imagine being able to have a GP surgery on a rewilding site where the waiting room can be in a wildflower meadow. And with green prescribing on the rise, you could just say, here you go, go into the rewilded bit of land, connect with nature, help your mental and physical health. So what is this rewilded space going to look like? And the answer is we don't really know. We've certainly got ideas and could take good guesses, but we're really waiting to be surprised to see what happens. And we've certainly been surprised within just the eight months so far from when it was last cropped. In the top right, this in blue is going to be the rewilding bit of the land. So really the majority of the site. And to rewild, it's probably actually one of the easier jobs that we've got. All we're going to do is reinstate natural processes and missing species. We're going to let them shape the landscape, restore the ecosystem to a point where nature can take care of itself. We'll let the field naturally regenerate, similarly to the other field. But with the grazing, we'll introduce the old breed livestock, the, old, the cattle, the horses, the pigs, probably from next year. And they're going to browse, rootle around, bash through the vegetation and hopefully create this dynamic mosaic of habitats that we think we might see on site. Throughout all of this, we're going to be continuing doing our ecological monitoring. So a big part of my role at the moment is setting up surveys. We're at around 850 species so far, but I'm expecting that to you know, double, triple. We, we haven't yet had a full season of like moth trapping and proper bird surveys and floral surveys. So that's already going to rock it up and then hopefully continue to grow as the site rewilds. And um, we're really going to be, we're going to be monitoring both the biodiversity and the bioabundance changes over time. We'll of course be getting volunteers to help. Already had lots of volunteers out on site, both surveying and doing a little bit of practical work. And we'll definitely be keeping people up to date about the work we're doing. And just an interesting point about the, the livestock is, as we're quite small in terms of rewilding, we're only 400 acres. Proper rewilding is on you know, 10 times the scale or bigger. So something we're really looking to show with this is that we can work with a tenant farmer they can, and they can have a, vi a viable business whilst the animals are grazed on a rewilding site. So we're working with a farmer who borders our land. She'll be buying in all the livestock. They'll be hers. She'll do all the husbandry. She'll get free grazing on our site for her animals. She'll also get hay uh, if we decide to cut some of the pasture fields to help reduce the fertility. So she's going to be saving money from not buying feed for her other animals. She'll get free grazing on the site. She'll get the sale of any meat from the animals on site. But we get the use of the animals for free and we don't have to do any of the husbandry. And thinking back to the point I made earlier about how this site was only producing 40 cows worth of meat effectively um, off off the site 
we're probably going to be producing a very similar amount of food to what was being produced then, which is really crazy when you think about it, because intensive farming, we've got all these inputs versus a rewilded site, you're producing the same food, but obviously we've got the massive increase in both ecological, environmental and biophysiological benefits. So the last thing, the last thing of the three I want to speak about is stage zero river restoration. This site is naturally incredibly wet. It's holding the headwaters of a river and it's got a couple of springs just off site that are draining through our site. And with a lot of farmland, similarly to a lot of farmland, it's been extensively drained to make it farmable. We've actually spoken to the previous farmers and the farmers before them, and they've all said, this is the best thing that can happen with the site. It's an absolute pain to farm. It's, it shouldn't be in farming effectively. So alongside every field boundary, there's a two to three meter ditch where the water's been redirected off site, forced off the land as quickly as possible. And this is taking all the excess nutrients, the runoff from the road, suspended sediments, straight into the River Sherford, which starts just off the boundary of our site, eventually running into Pool Harbour, where it's contributing to the eutrophication of the harbour, algal blooming, and really decreasing the water quality there. So we're looking to renaturalize all of the headwaters so that uh, we're, we're looking to relaturalize all the headwaters and create hopefully about 100 acres of wetland in the process. So the top left picture is a weir that we've got on site. This is so we can monitor where the water flows are, so we know which ditches are best to block up. The picture on the right, you can't really see it. There is a ditch run, running along the right hand side. It's just covered in cow parsley and hemlock. And the bottom two pictures on the left are kind of what we're thinking we might get, a mixture of wet pasture, wet woodland. To do stage zero river restoration, again, it's actually really quite easy. All we have to do is bring the water back up to the surface. Stage zero in the river restoration process is just water flowing across land in its most basic form, letting it go where it wants to go. So we can just get a digger on site, push the ditches in, make some leaky dams, push the water up to the surface and let it flow. We we kind of expect know what to expect at this transitional wetland of different pools, um, marshy areas, meandering riv river channels potentially, and through extensive soil sampling, we kind of know where the old riverbeds should be because we've found lots of alluvial deposits. But again, we don't know what the final the final picture is going to look like. But it should relatively quickly transform this large area and bring huge environmental and ecological benefits. It's gonna help flood alleviation downstream. The, the road bias often gets flood as does the neighboring farm. It should help filter out these nutrients and help remove the suspended sediments from the whole water course. So with all this in mind, what do I think is the future for this site? And I think for me, the site's going to evolve into this dynamic mosaic of self-sustaining habitats, which supports a huge number of species and help tackle the crises that we're currently facing. I want the site to act as an area where people can come and interact with nature, learn about wildlife and connect or reconnect with wilder areas, benefiting both their physical and their mental health. But most of all, I really hope this site encourages and inspires others to follow what we're doing use the blueprints that we're kind of creating at the moment to work for tenant farmers to go on and support similar projects or do similar projects themselves, because we need to be doing this in much bigger than just 400 acres. We need to be doing it countrywide, worldwide, if we want to re restore our ecosystems. So thank you very much for listening and um, contact my work contact details on the screen should you want to get in contact about the site at all. And Otherwise, and yeah, happy to answer, happy to answer any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Seb. Um, that was another really fascinating talk. Um, and I must say, I think you're a very good ambassador for the Dorset Wildlife Trust. So um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, now we've got three questions so far. If anyone else has got any more questions, then please just type them in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to start in the order that they're on my screen. So um, David asks, um, 
He lives in Hampshire and is a keen wildlife photographer. Will you be adding specific photography hides for the wilder areas? Uh, there aren't any plans at the moment, but there's that is definitely not out of the question. Um, that we, I think it's it's easy to with your traditional management of reserves, you tend to have you know two, three, five year plans. With rewilding, you need to be thinking kind of two hundred year plans. So we don't necessarily have the next few years planned out in kind of specific stages of things like putting hides in, but it could absolutely happen. We've spoken about maybe putting bird screens in and bird platforms for, for bird watching. So it's, it's, I can't say for certain, but it's, it's, it's not out of the question. I'd certainly like to see some. <laughs> great, thank you. Thank you very much, Seb. Um, now, Steve asks, um, a great presentation. Thanks, Seb. Um, what one or two species are you most hoping to see established on the site, indicating that the rewilding program is well on the way to success? It's actually a question I was going to ask you. So thanks, Steve, for asking that. It's an interesting one. Something I didn't mention in the presentation was that one thing we're really trying, trying to look to do is to kind of dispel that people think certain species live in certain habitats because it can be really dangerous that you'll, you protect, say, a heathland because it's got Dartford warbler, smooth snake there, whereas they will most likely live in other habitats as well. So I think for me, it's it's getting species on site and say in a scrubland is effectively what we're going to have, scrubby wood pasture that the people would expect to see on other habitats. So I, I have no doubt that we're going to have all six reptiles on our site within you know, 10, 15 years. We'll have Dartford warbler, we'll have nightjar nesting because we're bordered by heathland. So I think giving a specific one or two species, I'm not, not sure, but species that surprise people that they're there we're already getting things like like reed warbler nesting in our hedges nowhere near water and things like that so it's already showing that that it can happen and it kind of sh to show people that we need to change our mindsets about what what should be where great um and I, I thought it was fascinating what you were saying about the um amount of food that was actually produced off the site before it became you know your rewilding area and the fact that it's basically going to be the same I mean, that just, what a fantastic yeah. for what a lot of the rest of the country could be potentially. So yeah, great. Um, anyway, next one. Um, so Kat is actually asking two questions. Her first one is, um, did, did you observe any species you weren't expecting during the surveys? You just mentioned reed warblers, so maybe that's one of them, but. Um, yeah, um, there's a few. We did our first moth trapping session. We caught an emperor moth, which we certainly, certainly weren't expecting to get. Um, bird I mean I'm, I'm quite interested in my birds so bird wise we've got singing birds on territories at the moment that are quite rare in this part of Dorset so for example in, in Paul Harbour there's hardly any breeding garden warbler and we've got garden warbler singing on site already um, so that was quite a surprise there's I don't know my beetles very well but we've got a beetle a coleopterist an ex beetle expert and he's come he's got five six records already that a really rare in Dorset that there's been less than five records in Dorset um, just from one or two sessions. Uh, so I guess they they certainly weren't expecting anything that rare kind of this early on. Brilliant. Well, that's a good start, isn't it? Um, Kat also mm -hmm. asked if you'll be looking into ecological networks on the site. Um, and get, is that, I'm guessing that's referring to kind of linking it up to, to other places. I guess so. Um, if, if so, then absolutely. So my, my manager, his kind of main role is landscape scale conservation. So he's already speaking to 23 other landowners bordering us and creating this kind of one big area that stretches right from where I am right down to, to Wareham, which is about 7,000 hectares, which connects to the Arm Peninsula, connects to the National Trust land along the coast. And it's the whole kind of Purbex from Bear Regis south and southeast the whole area hopefully will be in one big conservation scheme ish in separate parts but all under good management and particularly in those areas we're looking to renaturalize almost all of the river sherford a lot of the river Froome, all of the river piddle um and it's yeah massive massive potential um, to have an effect all the way down sounds really exciting i think dorset is definitely right up there as one of the you know kind of areas where a lot of exciting conservation work's going on so yeah that's that's brilliant um finally um bethan asks you um 
She says, what's your advice for developing the ID skills and knowledge required for conducting the, the surveys you're doing? Just get, get out and practice. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm not a particularly good ecologist. I, I like my birds, I like my butterflies and moths. But I think similarly to when you're leading tours around a site, I think the important thing is to know your site better than anyone else. Like I, I'm going to bring, I'm going to give people, to, I've already showed people around that are really top, like on their micro moths and birds, and they're going to know far, far more than I am, but they're going to teach me when we're going around. But I, if, if I know the site better than them, I still feel comfortable. So I think it's knowing, knowing your site and what's on your site well, and taking opportunities when you can get kind of experts out on site and just so, try and soak up as much knowledge as possible. Um, it, and it'll take time. I mean, there's, it's endless the amount you can learn. Um, and I think maybe pick a topic a year or a topic every six, mo six months and go hard on that topic and say, le learn your 20 species of bee that are most common and then go on to ants and then, you know, wasps or birds or plants or, yeah, your bare ground specialists or, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you could you just never stop learning, do you? I mean, you're never going to become an expert on everything. Um, but yeah, yeah, great advice, Seb. Well, Seb, thank you very much for such a fascinating talk. And it's obviously going to be a really interesting project to follow um, over the coming years. So yeah, good luck with, with all the work, all the brilliant work you're doing. But yeah, thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, so that is Seb. And now final speaker of the evening is Jane. Uh, so hopefully Jane can hear me. Jane, if you could. Um, hi, Jane. Um, hi. Um, thank you very much, Jane. For Jane's rushed in from elsewhere, so I'm glad you glad you managed to make it in time. Um, anyway, um, without further ado, I shall hand you over to Jane, who's going to talk about um, plant responses to climate change. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing this. So Jane, yeah, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Um, shall I, I'll share my screen, I suppose. Is that um, yes, the best way to do it? Sorry. Is that? Don't worry. Yeah. I mean, we've managed to do the whole thing without any kind of technological um, breakdown. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I think. Um, it's not letting me access. Oh, sorry, I need to. I don't know what that noise is either. Don't worry. We've done really well. <laughs> We've done the whole evening without any technological. It's saying I have to leave and then rejoin. So... Okay, you leave and rejoin. <laughs> I'm so leave. sorry. I'll That's be... all right. Um, we'll see you in a minute. Okay, well, that leaves me to talk about something or other. Uh, Maureen, I see that you've just left a question in the Q&A. Um, um, and I, well, you've not a question, but a statement, which I completely agree with. So I hope you guys in Dorset are listening, but Dorset has and will have some exciting young conservation, it seems to me, from listening to these talks. So, yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, and oh, look, there's Jane. <laughs> Even better. This should work now. Goodness, I was not expecting that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, don't worry. We're, we're there. So that's brilliant. Um, I shall leave you to um, to do your talk. Can you guys see that? We can. Perfect. It's working Working a dream. Oh, lovely. Okay, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. So um, I'm Jane and today I'm going to be talking mainly about my master's project, which is on characterising plant phenology on the Aldabra Atoll and Seychelles. So I'll get over the boring bit first, <laughs> just a quick bit about myself. Um, so I'm currently a third year biologist studying at Oxford University and I'm going on next year, as I've said, to do my master's project with the Seychelles Island Foundation. And I joined um, the Australia Leadership Foundation in July of only last year, even though seems like such a long time ago um, but this was just kind of coming out of exams and COVID and I just remember it being such a lovely time because it really just helped me I guess re-shift my focus back to what I loved so much about biology and it really just helped inspire me again and find my passion for all these topics so yes um, I've put a few future aspirations maybe there's a PhD somewhere in the future but I won't go into that too much because I can go on about that for hours. 
Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm, as I say, going to be going through my master's project. So just a summary of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, what is the Aldebra Atoll? Um, I'm going to talk about why we need to monitor plant phenology, why it's so important. Um, I'll go through the key objectives of my master's project as it stands, and then kind of link more broadly at the end to what we can kind of learn about the role of evidence-based and adaptive management for successful conservation. Okay, so what is the Aldabra Atoll? It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, deemed as such back in, I believe, 1972 because of its outstanding natural beauty and its biodiversity value. Um, it's a raised coral atoll. It's only, I think it's second largest in the world and there's a map of it there. So it consists of four main islands which are based off of these ancient corals. Um, and there's a lagoon right there in the center and it's surrounded by a fringing reef. Um, historically, it's also been extremely geographically isolated, which means it's a rare case of an oceanic island that for the most part, it's managed to escape a lot of human activities. And so it's the closest, as we know, of what consists of a pristine environment. Um, as I say, um, it's outstanding biodiversity value. It's got iconic species like um, the giant tortoise, which is one of only two populations, the other being, of course, um, that in the Galapagos. Um, it's also one of the main nesting sites for the green turtle. Um, and it has the last uh, flightless bird in the whole of the Western Indian Ocean, which is the Aldabra rail. There's a nice picture of that one in the corner. Um, and it's been managed by the Seychelles Island Foundation since 1969. And that was set up when there were a lot of threats from human activities to maybe start using the island, I believe as a military base. So they kind of swooped in and they were like, no, we can't let this happen. Um, and one of the things, well, two more things that make Aldabra so special, the first of which, as I say, um, dating back to the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of um, research um, that went into the island funded by the Royal Society, um, and they launched a bunch of long-term monitoring programs for different species and plant phenology. Um, and that's kind of been the basis of a lot of really important research in ecology and conservation, and also a number of conservation successes. So Aldabra has seen uh, numerous uh, eradications of different invasive species over the years, um, like a sisal plant. Um, it's also seen the eradication of various non-native birds that threatened its um, local biodiversity because it's rich in a lot of endemic species, which tend to be a very high risk um, from invasives. Um, and then of course, as a small island in the Indian Ocean, it's extremely vulnerable to climate change. Um, the surrounding coral reef in particular is really vulnerable, as we know, to um, rising sea levels and uh, ocean acidification, all these kinds of things. So this is um, the overall summary I've put from the IUCN. Um, they classify Aldabra as good with some concerns, those concerns being largely um, the invasive species of rats, which is still present on the island, and of course, future climate change, which is quite unpredictable at the moment. So with that in mind, um, my project is looking into the plant phenology that has been monitored. Um, due to various reasons, lack of funding and so forth, uh, some initial monitoring had actually been stopped and only restarted in 2007. So there's now about a 15 year long data set for plant phenology that the Seychelles Island Foundation has been um, keeping up with, which is for the most part, one of is a really good source of data. Essentially 15 years is a long time in comparison to a lot of other areas that tends not to be uh, so much investment into monitoring plants as uh, you know, more charismatic animals, for example. Um, so this is a really valuable opportunity to explore these kind of um, topics. So, and that's just there, I've got a list of some of the things that the monitoring actually consists of. So it's just looking at things like um, the leaf growth, flowers, fruits, and checking for any damage that's on those plants. 
So these, sorry, a lot of information there, but essentially these are the five main aims that the Seychelles Islands Foundation set for why they wanted to monitor plant phenology. So it's essentially just acquiring a base of information for the different fruiting and flowering abundance across the seasons and across the years for common and also these rare endemic native species that are on our Dabra. Um, this phenology data can then also support other research and conservation activities on the island. Um, of course, plants are at the bottom of the food chain, so they are absolutely essential um, for understanding the population dynamics, say, of the giant tortoise or different um, threats from invasive birds, uh, a lot of different plant animals plant animal mutualism, so for pollinators and different seed dispersers, for example. Um, and the reason monitoring long-term trends, of course, is so important is because these can ultimately allow us to assess the effects of long-term climate changes and any one-off climatic events. So things like major droughts or maybe um, cyclones, which the area is also prone to. Um, then it can also allow you to identify various species that might need more immediately immediate conservation attention. Um, so if there's any sudden changes in flowering, for example, you won't know that that's a potential problem unless you're monitoring those species. Uh, and then finally, it can also it's also essential for um, being able to monitor other potential threats, such as new invasive species that might come from the mainland or other islands. Um, and as I say, damage due to rats or various pathogens like fungi. And then just to go over kind of some more specific things of why it's really necessary for us to be monitoring these, uh, the plant phenology is if you can see the top left graph over there, it shows that yearly drought frequency on our Dabra has been shown to be increasing, actually doubled in its occurrence um, since 1970. And so this is kind of giving us an early indication of there is, we can already see that there have been climate changes on the island. Temperature doesn't, ch isn't changing as much because it's kind of a more tropical region. Um, so it's really precipitation that we're gonna be focusing on. Um, and then the graph just below that is mapping the response of the plants on the island to those changes to yearly variation in precipitation. And essentially what that shows us is that plants are they're quite sensitive to these changes in precipitation, which might suggest that there could be a very important response in the future if those levels of precipitation change further. Um, and the map just shows that that can vary across the island depending on different types of vegetation. So deciduous plants versus evergreens, for example. And then all of this comes in the context of the rats, which are a extremely damaging invasive species, as I've mentioned. Um, and they are compromising already, even though Outdabra is commonly called pristine, it's not, that's not entirely accurate because these rats are already compromising the biodiversity there. And they've been there for uh, like a couple hundred years now. Um, so they really are limiting the biodiversity on the island. I think the main island, which is Grand Terre on Aldabra, um, it doesn't have a lot of the endemic species present because the rats are so pervasive there. So it is a real problem. And that's kind of one of the priorities of the Seychelles Iron Foundation is to be able to eradicate those rats um, in order to promote biodiversity for biodiversity's sake and um, support Aldabra as this beautiful World Heritage Site. Um, but also in a future threatened by climate change, that biodiversity and biotic integrity is gonna be essential for the island's future um, conservation and ability to respond to ongoing threats. Okay, so more into specifics of my master's project. This I've kind of taken straight from my research proposal, which is still in development, so it might not be perfect. Um, but these kind of four main objectives that I've outlined is first of all, to explore the data set because this is the first time that anybody's actually analyzing this data. Um, and it's going to be to essentially characterize the different plant species. There's 33 in total. Um, and that will be based on their typical responses to precipitation. So as I mentioned, are they deciduous? So do their leaves fall at a particular time of year um, or are they evergreen? Does that, and that, cause that will impact various things like the rats, for example, how long those plant resources are actually available. 
um, then the second objective will be to generate various time series um, for those different plant species for their relevant phenology traits and then characterize how sensitive they are to those precipitation changes we're observing. Um, and that can then hopefully enable us to predict how the phenology might change in response to future climate change projections. And hopefully I can actually um, generate some models that will project how that might be the case in the future. Um, then the third objective is to characterize the vulnerability of different plant species to rat damage. So which species have tended to see the most um, rat damage over the years? Uh, and then the fourth objective, the interaction between those climate changes and the, that rat damage. Um, so to what extent different plant species are experiencing rat damage across different um, levels of precipitation. And below, that's just an image. That's the map of the area where the data has actually been collected. So it's the island of Picard. And that kind of red line I've drawn across the island there, that's it's called a uh, back path. So that's essentially where they've selected various individuals, I think six individuals from each species. And every two weeks, um, a group of researchers on the island will go out and they'll uh, monitor, well, yeah, they'll note down the different uh, flowers or buds or rat damage they see on those different plants. And then kind of linking those to some broader goals, um, of course, is a very preliminary exploration of the data set and I'm sure much more will happen in the future. Um, but essentially it's the goal or the aim is to generate some actionable recommendations for the monitoring program itself. So is the data collected actually being useful or do we maybe need a higher number of individuals from each species to do um, effective uh, statistical work on climatic, um, well, changes with climate, changes of phenology with the climate changes. Um, and another point is that it's also just part of a broader framework to be able to feed back to management and conservation efforts. So for example, we identify particular species that are of particular risk at a specific time that might be able to inform uh, management on the island to better conserve these valuable resources, especially for those species that are rare, endemic and native to the island. And then finally, it can also identify new priorities for future research and conservation. So it might feed into a lot of the other work that's been going on um, with different bird species and the Aldabra tortoise, as I mentioned. And then again, just to kind of broaden up even further, um, I just thought I'd mention this uh, one paper, which I found quite interesting and very relevant. Um, it's based off of Oceanic Islands and they did a bunch of uh, interviews with local um, conservation practitioners to basically identify what the gaps were in terms of reaching effective conservation work on these vulnerable ecosystems. Um, and it's just interesting because they some of the things I identified at the bottom there of that the diagram on the right, um, some of the things, so lack of data management and analysis capacity, no time for data analysis, no dedicated data analysis position. That's essentially where hopefully I come in um, is to kind of help bridge some of that uh, barrier gap um, so that they're actually informed. And so that the people on the ground know that their work and efforts are going towards something that's gonna then inform better work in the future. Um, and then another interesting point on the right side of that diagram um, and quite relevant to the um, leadership foundation is poor leadership, of course, which is kind of unsurprising. Um, but it just, just goes to show that as part of a broader strategy for successful conservation, all these different things are important to consider. And my project, of course, is just a small, tiny section of it, but an important one nonetheless. And yeah, I just thought I'd end on this uh, diagram or illustration of all the different parts of leading to effective conservation management. Um, so research, analysis and reporting are some of the last parts, but all part of this long term strategy. So yeah, thank you for listening. Jane, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. That was really fascinating. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen now. Yeah.
Now, let me see, have we got any questions? Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, then just whack them in the um, Q&A, okay. Um, so Anna's asking a question. She says, I'll be starting a master's course in biodiversity and conservation in September. So I was wondering how you got the chance to do this particular research. Were you offered the project, project topic by someone or the university or did you choose it yourself? Yes, yeah, so my course is an integrated master's. So it's, it's technically optional, but most people do it. So we're already internal with the university and we were given a bunch of different uh, potential supervisors that we then just had to reach out to and kind of discuss with them the areas we were interested in, if their labs were capable of doing it with us. Um, and in my case, I was lucky enough that I had a good relationship already with one of my supervisors um, and they said that there was this data set available so that's kind of how that emerged um, but I, I know it can be quite different depending on the the route you're taking so I think if you're applying to uh, a master's project externally um, I probably I'm not the best uh, to give advice on that. No thanks Jane that's brilliant um it's, it's obviously a really interesting topic and something that is very pertinent with, you know, climate change projections and so forth. I mean, where do you see yourself going in the future, you know, after your master's? Have you got, um, is this the kind of area you want to stay in or, or what are you thinking or is it too early to tell? In terms of, uh, well, because this is quite a data heavy um, analytical project, whereas I think moving forward, my I guess my preference, so I'm, gonna, I'm happy to learn these skills, um, but my preferences tends to be more on the social sciences side of things. Um, I'm still very much interested in kind of plant biology and biodiversity ecosystem services um, and function. So I'm gonna stay within that realm. Um, and I guess it, it does link to this, but maybe going on to the policy side of things more in the future. Um, but yeah, so I plan on doing a PhD, but I've obviously not pinpointed yet where exactly. And I'm not saying you should have decided either, but you see where it goes. Um, uh, Bethan's asking, um, thank you for reminding us all about the interesting side of plants. Um, what purpose do the plants play to the rats? I.e., is it the primarily is it primarily food or for nesting materials too? What parts of the plants do they eat? Their rats, part of the reason they're such a big problem is because they will eat almost every single part of the plant. So the seeds is particularly critical, but also the vegetative part. So it really does um, affect their ability to reproduce uh, and be pollinated and dispersed. Uh, rats also will eat some of the pollinators. So it's a problem for the plants for that reason as well. Um, and it's really just the sheer abundance of these rats because the reason oceanic islands are so susceptible uh, to these invasive species is because they've evolved in the absence of any mammalian predators. So once they do arrive, they pose a real problem. Um, and what was the other part of that question? Sorry, I think. I think you've pretty much answered it, to be honest. Um, do, yeah, what, what parts of the plants do they eat? Well, you've said all of them. Um, <laughs> And is it, do they use them primarily for food or also for nesting materials too? Uh, oh, okay. I'm not sure about that, but I think another point I was just um, thinking off uh, the top of my head was basically what controls the rat populations is the abundance of the vegetation. Um, so that's why it's important to monitor the times of the year we might expect the abundance to be higher or lower because that's going to be important for informing when is the most effective time to attempt to eradicate the rats. So um, yeah. The rats are uh, causing a lot of debate here because Maureen's now asking how did the rats get there in the first place? Do you know? I believe on ships a couple hundred, a few hundreds of years ago, which again it's that debate of are they now part of the, the natural ecosystem or can we call is this like the new uh, stable equilibrium of the ecosystem state i guess in the case of aldabra the argument goes that it's such a valuable biodiversity resource of which we don't have many 
And the rats, although they've been there for a couple hundred years, they're not part of the native ecosystem and they were introduced by humans. They wouldn't be there had human settlers never been there um, when they were exploring those regions um, so long ago. So it really is harmful to the um, endemic species on the island. And as I say, with additional stresses like climate change, it really compromises the ability for those ecosystems to respond. Brilliant. Um, and the final question is um, another rat based question. <laughs> There's a theme developing here. Um, Kat says, um, will you look into rat species or is it just ratus ratus? So is it just just the one species? I think there are three different species of rats in these oceanic islands in general. I think it's the black rat, which is the main problem on our Dabra. I think there's also a Norway rat, which has been less explored. Um, but obviously, because my project isn't focusing on the rats, um, individual species as such, uh, I don't know as much on that. But I do know that there are three different ones. And the main issue is just the fact that they're there and, and, and obviously having a detrimental impact. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, Jane. Well, thank you very much. That was that was really fascinating. And, you know, all the best for your masters when you when you get started. Um, uh, we've just about finished. I mean, like, talk about good timing. Um, 8.57 is very impressive. I don't know if the other speakers are still listening. I wonder if you could just quickly put your cameras back on and your sound back on. Um, because I just want to give you all a huge thank you um, for participating and just giving such brilliant talks tonight. They were all fantastic. The, the time has absolutely flown by. Um, and I'm sure that everyone who um, is, has been listening has been absolutely fascinated. So thank you very much um, for, for, for basically getting our um, Evolving Conservation Leaders uh, seminar series off to such a fantastic start. Um, you are all brilliant ambassadors for OLF. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what we're hoping is that this um, is the first of many seminars. So um, Keep an eye on the Osprey Leadership Foundation um, social media um, over the coming weeks and months, and we'll obviously post um, anything else that we're going to organise. Um, and please just have a look at our website generally, which is ospreylf.org, which tells you all about the work we do. Um, so, yeah, so that's just about it. So um, I can see that there's quite a few people um, putting comments into the chat. So um, it sounds like everyone's really enjoyed it. So thank you guys very much.